Welcome to the Game Thinking Talk Show. My guest today, Charles Hudson, is the managing partner of Precursor Ventures, a seed stage investment firm that finds and supports extraordinary founders. I first met Charles when we both worked at Gaia Online, an art-focused online community and virtual world. We got to know each other better during the early days of social media gaming, when I was doing a brain game startup and Charles was building an events company that rode the wave of excitement around this new technology. Since then, I've watched Charles navigate the tricky terrain of startup land with grace and goodwill. I always enjoy hearing his sharp, perceptive take on what's happening in the world. And it might be his clear-eyed honesty that I find most endearing and inspiring because he's always learning, always reflective, and always looking to get better at his craft. Come hang out with Charles and me as we dive into what makes a great entrepreneur and how an investor can support that greatness without getting in the way. If you're new here, you might want to consider subscribing and hitting that bell to make sure you never miss a thing. Enjoy Charles Hudson. We've known each other a while, but there's a lot I don't know about you, particularly what you're doing now, so I'm really excited. So let's start with um, just a glimpse right into your work life today. Where's your core focus at Precursor Ventures and what does a day look like? Who do you interact with? What kind of decisions do you make? It's interesting because my assistant helps me track how I'm spending my time. The typical week for me is between 55 and 65 meetings, of which about half of that total time will be spent with companies where I'm already an investor. It's a, it's a big chunk of my time is spent supporting the founders that are already in the portfolio. Another 35% or so in a normal week is spent meeting new companies that we might invest in. And then the remainder is meeting with my investors, um, catching up with people that I like but don't get to see often enough, things like that. Those cool. being pretty full and because our, we have companies in 19 states. So I start usually with phone calls at six with our East Coast companies from sort of six to eight. And then it sort of moves into Midwest and West Coast companies late morning and uh, starts again the next day. How do you decide who to invest? Just the fact that you've got companies broadly spread, some people are more geographically located. You definitely care about who the founders are, but talk about your approach, the, the way that you focus and filter what you do. So, you know, most of the companies we invest in are pre-launch, pre-traction. They're very early. So you don't have KPIs or metrics or anything usually quantitative to go with in terms of your analysis. So a lot of what I'm looking for is, does this founder have a durable insight about the market they're going after that I think will be true for at least 24 to 36 months? And the reason that time frame is important is because most of these companies are pre-launch the world in which they launch or release the product will likely be different from the world today. And if the insight they have doesn't have legs, then by the time they launch the product, whatever it is, might not be sufficient to build a company around. So I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how thoughtful the founder has been around the product, the market need, the customer pain point, the go to market, all of those things. And for people who I think are really doing things in a unique and different way, they kind of jump out at you. You know, we'll do 25 investments a year out of two to 3,000 companies that we meet. So it's around 1% of the people we meet um, end up getting funded, something like that. It's a lot of filtering. It is. I enjoy it, though. It gives me a broad sense of, like, all of the things that people are working on. So I like, I like the volume. That's awesome. So how did you get to be the person having these amazing days? Where did you get started your entry point into tech and startups, and what were some of the key pivot points that really shaped your approach and your choices? Uh, I think I have one of the more random walks to my tech journey. I studied econ and Spanish in college and thought I was going to become a professional economist. And the summer before my senior year, I was in the coffee shop at Stanford, and I saw a flyer for a company called Excite that was looking for summer interns. And this is, you know, late 90s Silicon Valley. It felt like tech was all around us. I remember thinking to myself, this seems like the perfect time to try tech. 
something special is going on here. Banking, finance, consulting, these are all careers that will still be around in five or 10 years. This feels like a once in a lifetime opportunity to try tech. So I ended up on a lark deciding to go work for Excite for a summer. While I was there, I met someone who's still a mentor of mine today, and she introduced me to the team at Incutel, the CIA's venture capital group. And again, sort of on a lark, I said, well, you know, I've got some really interesting opportunities post-graduation that are much more stable, I would say, prestige careers that you would get coming out of undergrad, you know, your banking and consulting. I said, I had this really weird opportunity to go work for the CIA and help them um, invest capital in startups. And again, I said, I think the one that's probably not likely to come around again is the CIA venture capital job. So I ended up doing that for three years. I knew nothing about venture capital going into that job and it really opened up my eyes uh, to the world of investing and did that for a while. And then went back to business school and sort of graduated from business school, not 100% sure what I wanted to do. So I tried product management, which I have a ton of respect for product managers. I would not describe myself as a world-class product manager. And so I called somebody who'd been an intern of mine in college who was working at Google. And he said, hey, we have this group at Google called New Business Development. I think you'd really enjoy working for them. It's a pretty eclectic group of folks. So did that for a year and a half. And then I got the games bug. And I remember distinctly getting introduced to Min Kim when he was at Nexon and a handful of the really early free-to-play games folks who were bringing that model from... Asia to the United States. And at the time, a lot of people sort of scoffed at whether that would work, which seems funny today now that it's such an established model. And I, I started hanging out with those folks and then decided to do a conference and work in games and did that for five years and loved it and decided to go back to investing about eight years ago. You've been riding these innovation waves and you ride one kind of early and then you ride another. Mm -hmm. what's the wave you're riding right now? Just your own, I know you, you're your own data point, but you get yeah. a lot of deal flow, you see patterns, and you've got this interesting background of being early on these waves, but then moving on to the next one. What's capturing your interest right now? It's a little bit more of a macro thesis. So in the world of venture capital right now, I think there's probably never been more money in the ecosystem than ever before. And I think right now, everybody that I talk to would rather put more money to work with proven people who have traction. And I think it's left this big gap that venture capitalists used to really address, which was first time founder, maybe a little naive about running a venture backed startup, but really good, interesting idea. And so my macro sort of focus, the thing that's gotten really jazzed is I feel like that tier of entrepreneur who's maybe was a director or a manager level person at a public company or a startup who's got a good idea and hasn't done this before, doesn't want to raise a huge round. That person, I think, isn't really well served today. So like the thing that's gotten me most jazzed is meeting all of these largely first time, or I say, you know, first time successful founders who have really good ideas because 10 or 15 years ago, it was really hard to start a company. There weren't blogs, there was no Twitter, there wasn't this community of entrepreneurs you could plug into, you didn't have books like venture deals. It was this real asymmetry between what someone who'd done it before knew and what someone doing it for the first time knew. And so it's not surprising to me that there was so much energy on repeat entrepreneurs. Nowadays, there's a lot you can learn. There's tons of good content out there. I'd say your average first time founder has access to so much more in terms of both information and people than they did 10 or 15 years ago. I think it's a great time to be investing in people who haven't done it before. And I feel like that's not a very popular opinion in venture right now. Because of the risk profile? The risk wow. profile. And I think everyone right now, there's so many funds that have a lot of money where the calculus is, do I invest now with no data on this founder or this opportunity? Or do I wait six to nine months until there's more data? Of course, I'll pay a higher price, but I'll know more about the opportunity. And I'm like, well, if it's a good company early, you should get in as early as you possibly can. Well, that, that's often the angel approach, right? Yeah, exactly. So I think a lot of what we do is sort of angel investing at scale. That's a great way to understand it. So after riding these waves and having the experiences you've had as an entrepreneur, as a biz dev guy, as an 
as playing at different stages of the investing cycle. What do you know now about successful innovation that you wish you'd known 10 years ago? I think I, 10 years ago, I wish I'd known that if people are making fun of you, you're probably doing something right. And almost all of these waves that I've been a part of, there was a long period of time where people thought it was silly or a fad or it wouldn't work or they didn't understand it. And I think what I've learned is two things happen when you jump on a wave early. First of all, you know infinitely more than anybody else from the outside because from the outside, you can't really tell what's happening when it's early. And second, that community of people that you meet in the early days oftentimes ends up becoming the experts in five years. And by being plugged, into, plugged in with that early sort of adopter, early enthusiast scene, you get a social network in the space that ends up being really durable. And in every case, I can remember feeling the moment where like, okay, this is no longer the front end of the wave. People don't think this is crazy or weird anymore. People have sort of bought into the idea that this thing that I'm working on is a thing. And that's usually when I start thinking about well, what comes next. When did you feel that with social games? Oh, oh, boy. I really felt that probably as Zynga really started to get big. And people were like, wait, you can build something this big on top of another platform like Facebook. I think people said, we have to pay attention to this, whether you're in games or not in games, because it's such a big opportunity. Or as I would have said in the early days, I remember the first, the first virtual good stuff that I did, we could barely fill an auditorium at Stanford. And I remember the last one I produced had 600 people and we had people standing in the hallway and I could just feel that whatever skepticism or doubt had been present a few years earlier had gone away and people were like, well, this is definitely a thing. That's having your finger on the pulse in a nutshell, Yeah. right? Being able to gather that kind of data and see that pattern. How do you help and support and coach your startups and help, help them by leveraging, you know, the data you're collecting and leveraging your network? Wow, there's a lot of things that we do. It's interesting that you ask that question. Probably 75% of the questions that we get from the companies we back are, am I doing well enough? How am I doing relative to the market? And sort of what does the next round of investors want to see when it comes to fundraising? Then the other half is, I really need help evaluating candidates. Can you help me? On the first one, the advantage is we have invested in over 100 startups. And so we have a lot of internal data about the patterns and practices of the companies that have gone on to raise successful rounds. And when you help 20 or 30 companies a year fundraise, you start to get a spidey sense of which ones are likely to be successful based on their ability to tell a story, the, the data, all those things. So we do a lot to leverage our internal data to give the companies some perspective on where they stack up relative to the market. The other thing we do is, I'd say almost every session I have with a portfolio company, there's usually some ask or a question. For example, we have a portfolio company that ironically was asking me for some help uh, in, in building in some slightly gamified community elements to their product. I said, oh, if this is something you're serious about, I know three or four people you should absolutely talk to because they've either built this or coached people who've tried to build it. And I think they can save you a bunch of time. And that's, I think, the benefit of, of having worked in tech for 10 plus years as a non-investor is there's a bunch of people I've met in my operating career who are subject matter experts on marketing, on sales, on pricing, on go-to-market strategies, who can really help the companies that we back. So when you're having those meetings with all the people, and you look back on the 1% that you ended up backing, what are those particular signals about the idea or the founder of the team that make you lean forward and your, make your spidey sense tingle? I think the biggest one is that usually, if in a pitch, I learn one or two things that I didn't know about the market or the model going in and that are not intuitive, then I get really, really excited. Like, I'll just give you a, like a tangible example. We were early investors in a subscription media site called The Athletic. It's done really well in sports media. When I met Alex and Adam, <laughs> I talked to them. I said, hey, there's a lot of people competing for attention in sports. Like, it's a really crowded media landscape. And I said, well, we think sports is uniquely qualified for subscription. And they gave me a really, I thought, thoughtful answer as to why. They said, everyone else is doing ad-supported. 
we think that subscription unlocks a really different business model in terms of what you can afford to pay the writers and the quality of content you can produce for your audience when they're paying you up front. They also happen to have worked on the freemium to premium conversion team at Strava. So I knew that this was a team of folks who'd spent some time thinking about how do you get free users to love your product enough to pay for it. And they just had a lot of really non-obvious, non-intuitive benefits to a subscription product that have largely played out with that investment. The ones that are most disappointing are where someone comes in, they tell me what they're building, and I say, okay, the conventional way to build, we'll say a direct-to-consumer shoe company is buy a bunch of Instagram ads, try to drive traffic, keep your CAC to LTV ratio low. And if someone comes in at the end of the pitch, I'm like, well, everything you told me is pretty conventional and obvious you're probably going to have a lot of competitors or there isn't much durable in terms of that insight. And I worry about that. So I'm more likely to back people who I think might be the only person in the world who views the world through the lens that they view it. If I can buy into the story that they're telling. That's really interesting. So what are the signals conversely that like, say, let's say that starts to happen. There's an interesting story or something but the red flag signals that make you go, oh, maybe not, or um, just really cause you to stop and go do due diligence or really just pull back? I think for me, the big one is really an unwillingness to admit the parts of the model that are unknown. And so, you know, we're typically investing in companies that are pre-launch, pre-traction, one or two people. There's a lot of things that are unknown. And most of the founders that I back where, where we've been successful, they're very honest. They'll say, I have high conviction on the product. We think this go-to-market strategy is likely going to work. And I'll ask them, hey, what do you think consumer willingness to pay is? They'll say, you know, honestly, we're not sure. We think it's probably north of $3, but below $10. We're not sure exactly where it is on there. Or, hey, which of these marketing channels do you think will be most effective? They'll say, you know, based on previous experience, we think these three will work, but we have high expectations for this other one. And I found that like the people who are intellectually honest and say there's things that they don't know are the ones who actually end up finding the right answers. We have a lot of, we do encounter people sometimes who say this is absolutely going to work. And I think it's just false bravado. And I found that um, reality is way messier than a slide deck. And the founders who I think come in, come in saying, hey, we're going to learn. We're not entirely sure what's going to work. End up being much, they listen to the market more. And I think they draw more out the experiments that they're running. I'd say the other thing is just wildly unrealistic unreal financial projections. Companies that either expect to generate more revenue more quickly than I think typically works or expect to spend far less money <laughs> than what I think is market, unless of course they have some unique circumstances. You know, we have some uh, teams of recent college graduates who live in the Bay Area who have burn rates that are unconscionably low for any other company, but I understand why they're able to pull that off because of where they are in life. But unreasonable financial projections uh, typically have cascading effects on a business that relate to planning that often can be disastrous. It's good to be optimistic, except for when you're trying to figure out how to spend money. Yeah, there, there are a couple of documentaries recently on this festival in the Bahamas that had that issue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just binge watched them and it was exactly like unreasonable financial expectations or projections can have cascading effects. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is that one of the mistakes that you see a lot of first time founders make that those things you mentioned, are those really common mistakes? You know, the you most common mistake that I see first time founders make, it's related to this. It's a, it's a, a lack of understanding about the true amount of time and effort required to launch a product. So one of the things we've started tracking as part of our onboarding is understanding when did the person tell us they were going to launch the product when we gave them the money and when does the product actually come out? And I would say repeat, this is one area where I think repeat founders just intuitively have an advantage over most first time founders is I think they understand that despite their best efforts and despite uh, what they would like to see happen, launching products takes time. And what I consistently see from first-time founders is, I think, a refreshing but slightly naive optimism that everything's going to line up timing-wise and that they're going to get the product out on the schedule that they'd like. So for me, the question is always, well, how tight is the plan? 
And I also say that repeat founders tend to say, not only am I slightly pessimistic about our ability to release this product on time, I also want to make sure we have enough cushion that even if I'm, even if by being right, we, it takes more time, that even then we have a cushion. And I think that's the thing that I see get first time founders tripped up all the time is they get into a spiral where the product's late and they're not sure what to do and it increases their stress. They make poor decisions trying to catch up and make up for the fact that the product is late by cutting corners or releasing something that's not really ready too early, et cetera. That's a tough one, even for people that have shipped a lot of product. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think one of the um, threads that's really running through a lot of smart VC and entrepreneur thinking is being up front and learning from your mistakes, saying we don't know, we're gonna, maybe we're wrong, let's learn from it. Um, and you talked about having this open mind about not knowing and learning. What were some of the mistakes that you've made in your own career that you just learned a ton from? Oh, geez. that could be a whole series of podcasts. Pick I'll tell one. you one that's, <laughs> I'll tell you one that's like very, um, that's really influenced my thinking as an investor. So my co-founder and I started an Android games company in 2010. And I think we had this vision that, you know, iOS was maybe up here in terms of quality and Android was maybe here and that the gap was going to close really quickly. And that with all the device volume and all the resources that Google and the Android ecosystem had <clears throat> behind them, that we were years away from parity. And we were really, really, really wrong. And we were wrong, I would say, by maybe a decade of Android devices sort of being comparable, both not even just in terms of monetization, but product quality, distribution, all of that. And we had really pinned the hopes of the business on the fact that the gap between Android and iOS would close, either because there'd be so many more Android devices that even if you made less money per user, there'd be so many more users and that the device quality would be good enough that people would want to actually purchase those devices. And I'd argue, like it, for me, it wasn't really until the Galaxy and the Pixel that that started to happen, where people would sort of proudly carry an Android device and say, this is a good phone, and I, I had the choice of an iPhone, and I chose this instead. And the thing that really burned in my mind is, as an entrepreneur, when you get a signal that the market is not ready, no amount of late nights, or uh, high burn operations is gonna change that. Like in many ways, I think we should have done the opposite of what we did. We decided that we would try to will the market to exist. And I really wish we'd said, okay, this is gonna take a lot longer than we thought based on the state of affairs. We should stay really lean and mean because we can't force the market to show up. And so as a result, I spent a ton of time with the founders that we back. I asked him one simple question. You're doing this today. Why shouldn't you have done it two years ago? And why shouldn't we wait two years to do it? Like, what is it about this moment that makes this moment particularly interesting for the thesis that you have about the market? And sometimes the answer is, well, it's because I had the idea today. And that may or may not be a good reason to start a business. And I'd say most of our, like if I go back to The Athletic, the subscription sports site, the why today was that many other ad-supported media sites could no longer afford to hold on to their talent. So we were on the cusp of a lot of really talented writers who would be looking for new homes due to the ESPN layoffs and sort of the decline of traditional newspapers. That was, that was an important market inflection point. And I'd say many of the companies that we've invested in that have done well have understood that, hey, there's something in the market that's changing that's going to make building this company easier than it would have been before. So market dynamics and timing. Mm -hmm. Hard. So that's really interesting. Do you feel like your background as an economist and having a sort of systems literacy with how you look at the world shapes how you think about these things? More than I used to realize, honestly. It's only in the last two years that I've realized how foundational that training is for me. You know, a lot of times I'll talk to, I find if you bring up producer and consumer surplus in a pitch meeting, uh, people's eyes glaze over. But this notion that, especially in consumer products, this notion that, hey, how are we going to divide the spoils here? How much of the benefit for this product or service are we going to give to the consumer? And how much are we going to retain for ourselves? 
And there's a handful of businesses that I've seen, even in our portfolio, where I looked at the offering and said, I think this deal is too good for the consumer. I think we're actually giving them too much value. And if we continue in this way, we're not going to have a viable business ourselves. And I think there's some things when people make fun of, oh, these VC funded startups that are subsidized and make things really easy. To me, that's just a classic case of an imbalance between producer and consumer surplus. And I think a lot about supply and demand and you know, price elasticity, there's all of these things that are drilled into your head <coughs> as an economist that influence my thinking. The one that doesn't though is the nature of the rational consumer. Like that one you have to, I think, particularly when I have pricing conversations with our founders, I'm like, you should assume that people will respond to pricing in ways that economists would not predict. Right. Economies, economy, um, I can't think of the name of the uh, studying it, um, but it's due for an overhaul with the rational oh, yeah. because we have new mm -hmm. data, <laughs> you know, and it's, yes. <laughs> it's like, that's the thing about science or any field. When you go inside it, you learn that it's a bunch of theories and they change over time as people discover new things. Mm -hmm. It's not static. That's right. So that's really interesting. Um, where do you look for inspiration? Whose work inspires you? What trends going on in the world inspire you? Where do you get the thing that keeps you going? You no, know, I read a lot of biographies. Mm -hmm. um, I just find stories about people to really, like I just read um, David McCullough's The Wright Brothers biography. Ooh. It's amazing. It's an amazing book. And I feel like from biographies, I always learn something. And I think in most of the biographies I read, the protagonist is willing to do something that other people weren't willing to do. And then the thing that was shocking me about the Wright Brothers biography is there were a lot of people who talked about a uh, manned flight, but weren't willing to get in the plane. And they were willing to test these theories by actually getting in a plane at great personal peril. And one of the things that really struck me about the book was a lot of the things that they learned about manned flight only came from being in the cockpit and trying to fly and trying to build things that other people's models suggested would work, but didn't actually fly. And so I find these biographies of other people um, to be really fascinating just to learn alternative takes about the world. I think I spend so much of my life immersed in tech and startups. I don't need to read about that when I'm not but I'm not at work. So I really, really enjoy biographies, nonfiction. I read a lot of um, also political theory and sociology because I think a lot of what we do at, as investors is about understanding social trends and about understanding how individuals behave as individuals and as parts of larger collectives and groups. Yeah, that's an important topic. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, a, and a tricky one. Looking at all the meetings you have and all these, you know, hundreds of startups you meet with and the data points you collect on that, what are the trends going on right now in tech and in, you know, the world surrounding tech that you're following that you think are important? I think AI is probably overblown in terms of what it can do today, <laughs> probably underappreciated for what it's going to do in the long term. And I, I'm of the mind, we're not going to wake up one day and be like, oh, AI is here. I think it's going to be more of a creeping gradualism where you're going to realize that AI is chipping away at more and more things. It's not going to be, I think, this sort of lightning bolt moment. And I think you're going to see it in white collar work. I think you've already seen it in sort of manual blue collar work. I think it's like a really important trend that cuts across politics, finance, society, like everything. I, I think we still are in the early days of cloud software, which sounds weird to say, but I still think there are plenty of industries where software has not really had a dynamic impact on the way those businesses work. So we've been doing a lot of vertical market software. Um, I think the internet is made for marketplaces. So I have this evergreen interest in any business that sort of removes frictions between connecting two sides of a transaction that could benefit. And I think those businesses are ultimately low margin by design. When you're in the friction removal business, that's, that's kind of where you typically end up. I'd say the other thing that I think is um, 
really profound is I think as we change the nature of who gets access to capital, whether it's women or people of color, I think it changes the kinds of business that get started and funded. And I yep. think I'm really happy. We're seeing like we've, we've made a pretty big investment in women's health as a category. We're not really thematic investors, but I got really interested in women's health about three years ago. And that's a category that's been really fruitful for us as an investment theme. And I think what you're going to see is more and more of these businesses that, that maybe some people feel niche turn out to be much, much greater than anticipated because the people starting them have a much greater affinity for the problem than the people funding them. On that note, uh, one of the things you and I have in common is I'm female, you're black, mm -hmm. and we've both been working in yep. tech for a long time, raised money, yep. played different roles. Yep. And I've never uh, made that front and center in my business and in my, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, my identity in tech, nor have you. But mm -hmm. now these issues are becoming more front and center. Um, I'm actually starting some female only coaching programs for founders out of market necessity. Yep. The market coming to me and saying, need this. You're funding more people of color. I can look at your page and mm -hmm. see it, as are many people in your space. Kapoor's doing a lot with that. Yep. The issue, the diversity issue is coming up front and center. VCs are in business. They're not there to be nice. Yeah. Can you That's really right. speak to what's changed since you started working in tech and how, <laughs> what you feel is, is going on there that's, um, that's really positive? both just from the kind of how you feel about it, but just from the business opportunity. Yeah. So I'd say the biggest difference is when I got into tech, I think there was a general belief that tech is different from the rest of the world. The rest of the world might be sexist and racist or have all these ists and isms, but we're different. We're idea people. We're about the best idea winning. It doesn't matter who has it. We're, you know, it's fair. We're way more fair than the rest of the world. And I think for the last five years have really caused people to reflect and say, are we really that different? Are we really that insulated from some of these issues? And I think when you have a, an environment where people say, well, we're different, you can't talk about the fact that, well, my experience is that as a woman or a person of color, it doesn't feel as fair as what you're describing. And I think it was very hard for people in tech to reconcile the feeling that for some people it does feel fair, right? Like if you're a guy who went to Stanford undergrad and Stanford business school like me, like you're competing and you're competing against your peers, it can feel pretty fair. The people in that arena, the winner oftentimes can rationalize, but you're not asking like, well, who wasn't in the room? Like who wasn't given an opportunity to compete for that, for that, for that job or for that financing? And I think it's been the positive thing is I think whether people like it or not, and whether they agree with the root causes or not, I think there's a growing recognition that different people's experiences and journeys are different in tech. And that not every, it does not feel like a fair meritocratic process to everyone because it isn't. And the data would suggest that it isn't. And I think the upside has been that it's caused, I think, a lot of people to say, well, I don't want to be in a business that operates like this. I want to be in a business. And it's more fair and equal. And so let's look at our practices and figure out how to align what we'd like to be with what is. I think, unfortunately, there's other people who've said, I don't want to engage in this conversation at all. I think it may, either makes me uncomfortable, I reject the premise that things are not fair. And I think that it's, it's causing, I think, more friction in the industry between the people who really want to engage around increasing openness and making the industry more welcoming to outsiders and people who are like, I think, either uncomfortable or cynical about the motivation of those who are making that argument. People who are privileged never want to change that. That's very That's right. uncomfortable. It works it's, pretty well for them. It's human. It's, you know, a, a loss aversion. Yep. <laughs> pretty basic <laughs> stuff. Um, yeah. yeah, but, um, you know, one of the trends is that there's more people of color and women becoming investors and making yes. the decision about who gets funded. And you're yep. part of that trend that's becoming more mm -hmm. visible. And it's just, it's interesting and exciting. It also doesn't mean that every woman 
or a person of color who walks in the door it should get funded, obviously. That's right. That's right. If you look back on the choices you've made in your career and where you felt like you've added the most value, what do you feel is your superpower? Boy, um, that's a really good question. I can tell you what the founders we back at Precursor tell me. Data. Yes, um, tell us your data. <laughs> a lot of what they tell me is when they bring me problems, I'm good at helping them. I rarely tell them what to do. I don't think that's my job. I think it's their company and they're the leadership. They have to figure things out. But what I try to do is I try to say back to them what they said to me, but in a slightly different way. Because I think sometimes when it's your problem, hearing it in your own words, you can get stuck. If somebody else can distill it into something simpler for you, sometimes it can help you get unstuck. So a lot of times they'll come to me and say, well, you've got five things that are going on. And they'll tell me, I'm like, well, you have one, actually you have one problem. All five of those things are related to like the fact that like you had to solve pricing. So I suspect if we can solve pricing, all the other problems that you've identified are actually related to that core thing. And so I think I'm good at sort of trying to tease out the actual issue. And then a lot of times I just listen, <laughs> like I just listen to what they have to say and try to reflect back what I hear from them. And it's this, balance between being close enough to the company to understand the context about the person and being far enough removed to not be in the weeds. I think that's probably the most useful thing I can do for them as an investor. So people will bring me, and many times they bring me problems that to them feel complex that I'm like, oh, it feels complex because you haven't identified the root issue. And if we can get to the root issue, then it will seem simpler, which is not the same as easy, but it'll be a simpler problem for you to diagnose. Right. So finding root cause. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's such a powerful thing to do. So thank you so much for joining us today and hanging thank out, you. sharing your stories. This was awesome. I had a great time. Hey, innovator, wondering what innovation advice you should follow? It turns out that one size does not fit all. Take our innovators quiz and get your free customized cheat sheet packed with smart innovation tips that are tailored to you. Go to gamethinking.io slash quiz to get started.